It's time now for the award-winning number one local talk show in Northeast Pennsylvania, The Sam Lasant Show. Now here's your host, Sam Lasant. Well, folks, what do we know about the uh, medical uh, marijuana, the legalization of medical marijuana? Uh, surprisingly, today we have a great show for you. Um, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, we have Ed Payne, who we know as the president and CEO of Serrano Gardens. But however, Ed has a different hat on the show today. He's going to talk about why <clears throat> the state of Pennsylvania should legalize medical marijuana. Uh, and it's quite interesting. Now, just to give you an example of Ed's background, uh, Ed has a, a master's in social work. Uh, he is a licensed social worker. He has an MBA. He is a certified addictions counselor um, uh, diplomat, which is the highest level you can get. Plus, he's a c clinical caseworker supervisor with 37 years of experience. Uh, Ed, how are you? I'm well, thank you, Sam. I, I'm going to find the show quite interesting because, <clears throat> excuse me, we're talking about you are yeah. uh, you are advocating that we should legalize medical marijuana in the state of Pennsylvania. That's right, and in fact, uh, Pennsylvania does have a measure before Congress now. It was uh, introduced last year, and I testified uh, before a House. Health and Human Services Subcommittee in Harrisburg, along with uh, a group of distinguished physicians, religious leaders, uh, and many, many others uh, on behalf of this. Uh, Phyllis Mundy was one of the co-sponsors uh, from just up north of us. So I am speaking today as a member of the board of directors of Pennsylvanians for medical marijuana. And this is my distinction between recreational and letting a doctor have control. Well, that's the that's going to be the interesting thing yeah. well, because there's two there's two scenarios here. Yes. Um, as we know, we have handicap parking, okay? Yes. And there probably are, in my estimation, fifty percent of the people that have handicap parking should not have handicap parking. All right, Very because they they really should reserve it for mm -hmm. people who have handicap parking. So what happens is someone will go to a doctor and say, "Look, I have a bad back. I have a bad leg. My head screwed up." Give me a part, and boom, he writes a prescri prescription. Mm -hmm. So we would be concerned about whether this is going to happen when you say recreational versus medical, okay? Right. Um, that's always a thought that mm -hmm. I have, okay? I don't know if anyone else will have that thought. Certainly. Number two, I'm sure because of your background uh, and knowing who you are personally, um, I find this quite interesting. So this show is going to be a, a learning experience for me to find out why the state of Pennsylvania should legalize marijuana. So mm -hmm. I think you brought with you a, a, a PowerPoint here, That's okay? Right. So to walk us through this, um, Andy, if you would start, you, you could start with the Power Pro Very PowerPoint good. program, and you looked at right there. Okay, good. <coughs> um, th it's important to know that marijuana was legal in the United States uh, to use as a medicine throughout history, throughout its history, up until. 1937, uh, and that was when there was a hearing, a two-hour hearing on marijuana, and that's coming up a little bit later. So just to give you a little brief history, uh, there has been evidence of the medical use recorded, written down for about 10,000 years. Uh, 2700 BC, uh, there were writings from the Han Dynasty in China, which had a number of various conditions. 1400, we're going to skip over a whole bunch of millennia here in a minute. 1400 BC, there was actually Bronze Age uh, trade in, in cannabis and opium. So we, were, we had, as a species, had discovered this early. And then uh, cannabis uh, drink recommended in India for, uh, for, as an anesthetic, which it does work, and an antiemetic, which it is rather famous for uh, today. Uh, antiemetic means it stops vomiting. Uh, 200 BC, there's uh, some Egyptian hieroglyphs showing uh, cannabis as a use for something else. And we can go to the next slide almost immediately here. And then around, uh, skipping a, a couple of thousand, skipping a thousand years, uh, in 1621 there's a, a, a text on the anatomy of melancholia uh, by an English clergyman, Robert uh, Burton. And he was claiming that cannabis, which again, legal, uh, for the treatment of depression. The handsome gentleman on the left there is William O'Shaughnessy. He was a, uh, working with the British India Company, so he got a lot of the information about it. Uh, from his work in India and wrote a number of articles very much in favor of how this was uh, be being used. And, rather surprisingly, uh, you see on the bottom here that the Smith Brothers cough drops uh, had cannabis, uh, uh, cannabis indica. It's one of the extracts uh, as part of the cough suppression. So, uh, you know, there's, a, again, things that are fairly familiar. Now, in the 20th century, 
uh, up until 1937, there were a number of tinctures, if you will, because that's how it was extracted and then put into various tinctures, that were used for a variety of purposes. Some of that was dysmenorrhea, uh, cramps that would accompany a menstrual period, uh, hacking coughs. Migraine uh, was a rather well-documented uh, use for cannabis. Queen Victoria actually used that for severe migraines uh, to some effect. Uh, so, you know, when we're talking about the, the use of cannabis, it's important to understand that there is a huge history of, of this coming forward without incident. You know, a, a quote from the American Journal of Nursing once said, in the 5,000 years recorded use of this drug, not a single overdose had been associated with it as a specific drug. So that's, you know, that's very, very important uh, to recognize that we have, you know, several thousand years coming up to a slide you're going to see in 1937 in the United States uh, that showed that use of the drug as a medical entity, which was almost entirely what it was for, uh, had a great deal of effectiveness in a variety of conditions. More modern research, uh, and we'll get to that as well, has shown use in a whole new, well-researched, peer-reviewed. I don't read the general stuff on the internet. I go to nerd sites from medical journals. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's uh, where this is coming from. So your, your testimony, okay, yes. uh, to the House, yes. uh, was what? My testimony to the House was to make the distinction between use of any drug for its recreational purposes and the use of a drug for medical purposes. The safety uh, in terms of dosage of marijuana by comparison to just about anything else and the fact that you know, the idea that, uh, you know, it was, and this is from the United States government's own uh, uh, Institute of Medicine study, distinguished physicians that work for the United States government, uh, that said the gateway theory is no more true than for anybody who took a Xanax and turned into a, a Xanax addict, a Vicodin, and turned into an opiate or a, uh, someone who drank and turned into an alcoholic. There are many ways people come to drug abuse, but the idea that marijuana was the gateway uh, was something that was not proven by extensive research that they did. And based on your past, okay, yes. and your record, okay, which is exemplary, it's a mm -hmm. fa fabulous record okay. here, um, you um, have seen a number of people who have started off uh, in recreational use with mm -hmm. marijuana and then gradually went into harder drugs. I, I do have to stress, though, that a lot of those were also drinking. It had a lot to do with peer group, and it wasn't that... For example, you saw an, an article in the uh, Sunday, uh, December 4th, uh, Standard Speaker about the amount of heroin. Uh, it wasn't that you know, a kid tried marijuana and then went to heroin, which is going to grab them and hold them potentially for the rest of their life. So you know, it's important for a person like me and you and everyone to evolve over time as research says, wait a second, some of these initial assumptions, yes, I was one of those, don't ever legalize this one early in my career, but I, again, I'm a rather schooled researcher, and when the evidence piles up and becomes overwhelming, it's important to reevaluate your initial positions and not stay where I was more than three decades ago. And, and I think that's the critical part here. The, uh, I think people have to be really educated about yes. this. That's why we're having the show, because mm -hmm. it seems like, you know, you're talking about a, a scenario here where, you know, a drug, you know, a marijuana is a drug, yeah. all right? And now what happens is, you know, you are in this, you are mm -hmm. advocating why people should not, especially with kids. Right. Well, people misinterpret that, such as, well, yes. listen, they're using it now for medical, so it has to be good for me, okay? Right. Uh, it's like anything else. Which is the same as parents are drinking, therefore I exactly. can. My yeah. mom's taking a Xanax, so yes. can I. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I got Vicodin from the doctor for my toothache, so that must be okay. So I, you know, we really need to look at that in the whole context. And, and, and so that's what I'm trying to say. Will that open the door for more use of recreational marijuana? No, because, and actually there's some research in the states where this has already been legalized, and there's 16 and we'll show that map, uh, where that use of among young people has actually reported to have gone down. Okay, folks, I'm talking to Ed Payne. They're quite interesting because Ed is a, a, a staunch believer in staying away from drugs, okay, because he has seen the sad stories throughout 37 years of experience. Uh, when he comes back, we have more to tell you about why Ed Payne feels we should legalize medical marijuana in the state of Pennsylvania. Stay with us. 
Well, folks, should the state of Pennsylvania legalize medical marijuana? Interesting uh, subject, and the uh, person here who is, the, who is advocating that, believe it or not, is Ed Payne. And we all know Ed Payne as the president and CEO of Serenal Gardens. However, Ed has a, he is a certified addictions counselor diplomat, which is the highest le level attainable. Uh, and he is speaking on behalf of legalizing medical marijuana. To continue on with your presentation here yeah. that you made with the PowerPoint. And it's, let's, you know, let me add though, that I think I mentioned on our break, so I just did, uh, I think what was Pennsylvania's first uh, conference uh, at Geisinger Medical Center, conference on palliative care for more than 100 physicians uh, who received credits, continuing education uh, credits for this presentation that I gave them on medical marijuana. What we're doing here is very abbreviated. So, you know, even at the physician level right now, this is getting good reception. So let's continue. Uh, I'm bringing something up. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the road to prohibition, how we got from all of the stuff I just talked about to where we are today. So let's uh, bring up another slide. Medical marijuana was legal up until 1937 when that gentleman on the left there, his name is Harry Anslinger, uh, who was the first commissioner of the Bureau of Narcotics. Now, Anslinger was an avowed racist. Uh, and, you know, with very strong feelings against the minority populations. Now, and these are his quotes coming up. The primary reason to outlaw marijuana is its effect on degenerate races. And this is how this starts, so you understand. Uh, he said at that time there were 100,000 marijuana smokers in the United States. Most of those were Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers, and I always wondered how Bing Crosby or Bob Hope might have felt about that. Uh, and this was reefer makes Negroes, and I cleaned up the word Negroes, so you understand, because it wasn't that, it was a bad racial slur. It makes Negroes think they are as good as white people. And some of his other remarks can, uh, continue that marijuana is the most addictive drug which produces in its users insanity, criminality, and death. You smoke a joint, you're likely to kill your brother. Marijuana is the most violence-causing drug in the history of mankind. So this is where this starts with this single individual and nothing medical prior coming up to it. What's our next slide? And then uh, the uh, Bureau of Narcotics produced a couple of, uh, were part of producing a couple of uh, what are now uh, cult hits called, Re well, one called Reefer Madness, released in 1936, just prior to the hearings from the Bureau of Narcotics. And you're going to see that you know, it is the idea that white women were being swayed by this drug uh, and portrayed the drug as, uh, uh, the, you know, as extremely harmful. Uh, the drug uh, was still legal and it was still approved. So you understand that the Food and Drug Administration of the United States still had it at this point as a legal drug as part of the United States pharmacopoeia. So we go to the next one and what they had were prohibitions in 1937. One doctor was called to testify. Now I'm going to say these hearings were two hours in length. That's it, beginning to end and produced about two typed pages of testimony. The only doctor W.C. Woodward, whose testimony does not appear in the transcript, uh, was supposed to be there, they thought, to uh, pan marijuana. Instead, he repeatedly remarked that there was no evidence uh, showing the drug was harmful, and he urged the committee to make the, keep the drug legal. He was dismissed, actually, with the words, if you don't have something good to say about what we're going to do here, please leave. So he was basically put out of the hearings, uh, said they lasted two hours. Uh, the bill uh, passed uh, in December 1937, and it was a tax act, a catch-22. In order to possess marijuana, you had to have a tax stamp. But in order to purchase the tax stamp, you had to demonstrate that you had the marijuana. So it was if you showed up with the marijuana, you got arrested. If you, had, you, know, you went for the tax stamp, you couldn't get it without the, uh, with the hearing. So we go to the next slide, because this is important. I want you to understand, Sam, that this is the single moment in all of history of this drug, the moment that snapped history in two, absolutely nothing before those hearings, nor anything since has shown that medically supervised marijuana causes any harm. That was it. The prohibition was racially motivated and was opposed by the medical community. But Sam, this is where it breaks, right here. And that's it. Now, I don't know what the public has been you know, called to believe up to this point, but this is when I, when I started doing my research and came down to say, wait a second, 
we had nothing medical that said anything about this. We have this man with these incredible racial slurs. We have a hearing that lasts two hours. And people are getting thrown in prison. The doctor who was there said, please leave it legal. The Food and Drug Administration said it was OK. And one man, seeking to change something in two hours, caused the problems that we are having today. Like any drug that is uh, produced mm -hmm. by any pharmaceutical company, yes. there are a series of tests That's correct. Okay, that have to be used, whether it's animals or what, mm -hmm. whatever, however they do the test then the Drug Administration right. uh, approves it. Right. Okay, now, with that being said, yes. we have 16 states, I think, that have already approved That's correct. medical legalization of medical marijuana. That's right. What have been the history of some of these states? Like, in other words, what have been some of the successes from people who have been using medical marijuana? That's our test okay. right now. Now, I want to subtract to a certain degree here the state of California because it's turned into the Wild West. And I think it was lax enough that it, do, it doesn't have the kind of controls. However, if we look at uh, Arizona, uh, governed by a uh, Republican and was, uh, has been for a while, or we look at New Jersey, uh, who has just passed it and now implementing the, uh, the mechanisms, Oregon, Alaska, Hawaii, uh, New Mexico. So we have a lot of states that have said this is, is using it right now. And the drug is being used as in, for a number of conditions. One of them is well known as an anti-emetic stops vomiting very, very well. These are the states we have. Okay, so good. people just know. Yeah, that. so we have Arizona, <coughs> Alaska, California, Colorado, uh, and some Delaware. Of the more conservative states. As you oh, know. yeah, you can see that. And yeah. the light green color are the ones, and you can see Pennsylvania among them, that are considering the red legislation. And the red are those who are not doing anything with it right now. But about, a, you know, more than a third of the country, or about a third of the country right now uh, has it legal, and more than, a th no, you know, very nearly half the country uh, has uh, either legal or measures in front of it right now. So you begin to understand that, listen, you know, the, the entire country can't be wrong here. Well, I think the, the stigma here, mm -hmm. okay, uh, again, you've been told so many times, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you've seen it via the media, mm -hmm. other than what the, the Hollywood does. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they screw up everything. Yes, I mean, they, they make, do. you know, they make cocaine and they make yes. uh, everything, you know, uh, it's a dis they're, to mm -hmm. me, they're, they're, it's a disgrace what they do and how they're affecting young people, yes. okay? Uh, they know what they're doing, okay? Yes, and the sad do. part is the f families are fighting this mm -hmm. so their kids don't get involved with that. Right. So with that, again, uh, the stigma of marijuana, yes. all right, has been, wow, okay, my kid, or, or you know, you're using it, it's okay. That's, yes. again, we're, we're on the track to inform right. people that there is a major distinction here. That's correct. Okay, so to, to con and and you're, what you've been doing right now, based on all the research, is letting people know that this is uh, a use that should be legalized. Medical supervised use will benefit tens of thousands of people. Folks, I'm talking to Ed Payne. Uh, quite interesting, folks. Uh, uh, Ed is president and CEO of Surrender Gardens. Has done a great job in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and the surrounding areas. And now he's in front of Congress saying we should legalize medical marijuana. Uh, well, uh, I may have been against it before that, but when Ed Pence, Payne says that, I'm listening. Okay, stay with us. We have a lot more. Welcome back to the Sam Lasan Show, folks. 24/7. Get watch us on SSPTV.com. My guest is Ed Payne, who is the president and CEO of Sorrento Gardens, but he's wearing a different hat here, folks. He's advocating uh, that we should uh, pass legislation for the legalization of medical marijuana. Now, there's some research involved with this, yes. right? Okay, yes. so going to our PowerPoint, because we're limited mm -hmm. with time, let's give us some All research. Right. And we're gonna do this quickly. There are a number of, I, I, I am a, a, a researcher and, and a statistician, uh, among other things, so if we can go on this. Uh, resurgence of research. It's important to know that the government has made whole plant research virtually impossible by refusing to provide the plant uh, to researchers legally grown samples. So there's a physician, Donald Abrams, and I'm not going to read through all of that, uh, who was authorized by the Food and Drug Administration to do some research uh, on the plant for AIDS wasting syndrome, and he couldn't get it for years until the lawsuit broke it forth. And he said the National Institute of Drug Abuse had a mandate from Congress that they could supply marijuana uh, for research to show that it might be dangerous. So it took a few years to get that in. Let's do another slide. 
Okay, uh, at this particular point, uh, in this October of this year, the, the Food and Drug Administration approved another study, and that was uh, for veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan war who were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. They wanted to start working with the plant, not necessarily in a smoked way, but with whole plant. Uh, and they, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, the, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, refused to release the drug uh, to the researchers for an FDA-approved study, which is now the government is basically telling the government no, uh, which is kind of crazy. So continuing, there's something called the lethal dose 50, the LD50 uh, index, and this is uh, all drugs tested on animals, and LD50 is the dose at which half of the lab animals die uh, from a drug, and uh, humans uh, may die from much lower doses, but they test this first. So an example of LD50s for aspirin is about 200 milligrams per kilogram of weight uh, in a lab rat. Botulism toxin, which is used for Botox, uh, is one nanogram or one millionth of a gram per kilogram of body weight. So it's, that's, that's actually the most uh, toxic out there, uh, legal for uh, surgery. So marijuana is LD50, uh, was estimated uh, 1 to 20,000 or 1 to 40,000. Uh, at present, there is estimated that marijuana's LD50 is around 20,000 or 1 to 40,000 uh, in layman's terms. It means that in order to induce a death, marijuana smoker would have to consume between 20,000 and 40,000 times as much marijuana is concerned as is in one marijuana cigarette. The National Institute of Drug Abuse supplied cigarettes weighing approximately 0.9 grams. A theist a smoker would theoretically have to consume about uh, 1,500 pounds of marijuana, and this is a research study, okay, 1,500 pounds of marijuana uh, in about 15 minutes to cause the death. So, so what, we're, what we're doing here, okay, yeah. uh, for the sake of time, is, yes. is you're presenting research as to, once yes. again, why, the, you know, yeah. the legalization of medical marijuana. Uh, who would be people that, would, that doctors would recommend me medical marijuana? For? Those with uh, severe nausea, uh, as from chemotherapy. Uh, has great use in spasticity in multiple sclerosis. Uh, it has a, a significant amount of use in migraine headache. My wife, uh, rather ironically, died from Crohn's disease. Uh, two years ago, it was discovered that this drug quiets the disease. And it, it is it's very poignant and somewhat bitter, uh, sweet for me. And I will tell you, I told the doctors, I would have risked my career and my freedom to give her a day's comfort from that suffering. You know, I know there's, we're running out of time here, so let me just end you with this quote. First of all, there's a measure before Congress now. But the federal government has managed to keep marijuana out of the hands of licensed physicians. Yet they have cut all my funding for education so that I can help keep it out of the hands of 12-year-olds. And there's a horrible irony there. It's not unhorrible, Ed. It, it, it is disgusting. Okay, it is disgusting because of the lack of inf information that some of our Congress people are not allowing to, to, to absorb. We're not asking them to do anything that is wrong, but there is a classic example of what you're talking about. It is, it just, it just frustrates me to no end that we are electing people who are not capable of doing what they should be doing, okay? Yeah. And I've said this many times. Please check credentials of the people we put in office. And I'm not talking about any of the current ones. I'm saying there's a reason for this. Ed, I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much. Sam, thank you. Okay, Phil folks, Ed Payne, when Ed Payne says we should legalize medical marijuana, I think we should. We'll see you next time.